And next week will be my fifth lecture, and that's my last lecture for a while. And then um, we have a series of guest lecturers who are coming, starting in two weeks. So I look at that as very exciting, to see what they have to say. Um, and that list of guest lecturers should be on the website. So I think two weeks from today, it's Rainer Gillette, and then Shelley Tishkow is coming over from SIU to talk to us. And it'll just go on from there. Um, so today, I'm picking up where we were last week. Come on, Alex, you can sit over here. We've got lots of, you can sit, there's an open seat right there. Just don't bump the cameraman. <laughs> um, so I'm going to review a little bit, because a week is a long time. I don't know what you guys did since last Wednesday. I did a lot. I wrote a huge grant, stayed up all weekend working on that grant. And then I came back, and it's like, oh, I'm in another place now. But um, it's, I think it's good for me to kind of let you know where we were last week. And um, we'll pick up from there. So I started with the notion that you could think about the question, why do you sleep at night? It's a, it's a reasonable question. And it seems like a natural thing to do um, for us, because we've always done it. Uh, we sleep less at night as we get older. But we talked last week about what the anatomical substrates by which the light signal accesses the clock. And I want to just start with that. And, um, and then we'll move into the mechanism by which the light signal accesses the clock. So um, I remember I told you the story of the bunker and the people who went and stayed down there and how their rhythms, humans' rhythms, ran longer than 24 hours. And so if they're gaining basically an hour every day uh, after two weeks, they're no longer going to be sleeping at night with respect to the outside world. We talked about how the circadian system sees light differently than the rest of the visual system. And then we had um, this this uh, set of actograms or wheel running records from a wild type mouse on the left. And this one actually, it's not free running, excuse me. It's in a dark cycle and a light cycle. And so it's starting to run at the onset of darkness every day and running only during the night. And then here we have a mutant mouse. And that mutant mouse has three deficits. It's missing the melanopsin, the ability to make melanopsin. It's missing rods, which are um, what perceives basically dark and light in the eye. And it has a defect in the cones, so they sort of degenerate. They're not completely gone, but they're pretty degenerate. And those animals have visual impairment. In other words, they can't recognize visual cliffs if they're walking along a little stage. And there's a there, they can't see that, because they don't have that. Those, those parts of the the retina are bringing that information in. And these animals are behaving like what? Like they're free running. Because mice run shorter than 24 hours, and so even though there's a very strong you know, dark light cycle, they're just running right through the darkness, just like the humans in the cave, the bunker were. Um, and I also went back and looked at some, some of Samir's papers today, uh, because we're reading one of his papers for the discussion. and. They, um, they got rid of just the melanopsin expression and those animals um, basically free run. So it isn't that you need, you, you do need the rods and the cones for some of the finer modifications, but you absolutely need the melanopsin there. If those cells are there, but there's no melanopsin in them, guess what? The animal free runs. And this reminds me to tell you that this was to be expected because there was work done by some of the human neuro chronobiologists, um, it's a big group at Harvard Medical School, and they looked for blind people to ask them about the way in which they conducted their lives. And of course, there are some blind people or people missing their eyes, m missing their retina, who um, they can't perceive light, they can't perceive shapes or colors. But there is a certain subgroup who have never knowingly seen a shape or a color. And yet, their activity patterns look like this. Now, why do you think that would be? These are people who have retinas, it's, but they can't see shape and they can't see color. In fact, their whole lives, they never remember seeing anything. They don't have any curtains on their windows 
Why would they? Because they don't have any perception of the visual world. Luke? They have an alternative receptor? <clears throat> they do have an alternative receptor. But it's, not, it's an alternative from the rods and the cones. It's this receptor. So that pathway, the, re the melanopsin cells, are still there. So you can take a, a rodless mouse and a coneless mouse, and they'll still entrain to life. But, and the same thing is true of these, human, these humans. And they, they did a, a, an absolute test for the existence of the pathway from the melanopsin retinal ganglion cells to the brain. And that was, they gave them a flash of light at night. Now, I have mentioned, I didn't really go into it very deeply, that melatonin is the hormonal signal of light in the body. When the lights go on at night, immediately you stop making melatonin. Your melatonin levels go down. And that pathway comes right in from the retina to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then it has a couple of steps, goes down into the, into the superior cervical ganglion and then to the pineal gland. And those individuals, whose, those blind individuals whose patterns look like this, stopped making melatonin when you gave them a flash of light at night. And so that is a second kind of evidence that this is, this, this is a completely separate pathway from the visual pathways, and it's intact in that subgroup of blind people. So that was some, actually, I thought, a very interesting uh, study. Came quite late in the story. We already knew there was a special pathway from the eye to the SCN. And I have, I think, this is just a reminder what those, those melanopsin retinal ganglion cells look like. They're basically all over the retina. They have a little network cat catching the light. And it's a very primitive type of retinal ganglion cell called the W cell that's <laughs> in lower vertebrates. It's, but we retain it, and it has this, this special property. Now, here's our, our model of the human brain again. And here's light coming in to the eye. And it's got this special pathway going into the clock region. And it's called the, because of its anatomy, the retinohypothalamic tract. Retino, because it's coming from the retina, to the hypothalamus, retinohypothalamic tract, or RHT. And it's, it's, it's comprised of, it's in the optic nerve, but it's comprised of the axons of these melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. They're going right into the brain, and they're innervating the SCN. What you probably know from the paper we read, and I, I did mention it, they go other places too. When these cells were first discovered, they, they thought they only went to the SCN and then they had this branch going to another part of the brain involved in, in light processing. But now we know there are five different types. We don't know how extensively different they are, but we know, for instance, from today's paper, that at least one type mediates something completely different than entrainment to the clock. That one mediates a mood and you know cognitive effects on learning. Uh, so this is turning out to be a treasure trove of interesting information because it's carrying these other kinds of information about light into the brain. So here we have um, the uh, the retina with the the uh, optic nerve with those axons going in, and they're going in. Then this is a like a cutaway this all the way into the brain, and they make this so-called synapse where the end of the axon forms a specialization and each one of these is a little vesicle filled with a chemical neurotransmitter, a chemical signal that this neuron from the eye is going to liberate then on the cells of the SCN when? When is it going to do that? When the light comes on at night, for sure. It also does it in the daytime, it turns out. But what I'm going to tell you is it doesn't have any effect on clock phasing there. Um, the intensity of the light may, may have some kind of effect. And so if we're going to understand how the clock in, is engaged by light signals coming in through the eye, what we really want to know is what's happening here, where the output of the signal from the eye then engages with the cells that are keeping time in this master clock. And what I've put up here is a note that the established neurotransmitters are an excitatory amino acid called glutamate. And this is the excitatory amino acid transmitter at all sensory synapses. All places your sensory system is bringing information in from the outside world, 
use glutamate. It's a very rapid transmitter, has a very interesting and complex physiology, um, and it's what this, those melanopsin cells are talking to the SCN with. There is also a peptide there called PACAP. I'm not going to talk about PACAP. That's a whole, you know, special story. PACAP is a modulator of what glut, uh, glutamate does, but we're just going to focus on glutamate and if you're really dying to know about PACAP, I think my lab did all the work on that some years ago and it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a separate story. But we're going to talk about glutamate and how it works. Um, and then, of course, it's not just that you have to have the signal talking to the cells, but remember where timekeeping takes place? We talked about it as being primarily due to a transcription translation loop. It also involves cellular metabolism. That hasn't been studied with respect to the molecular clockwork. But what has been studied is how these chemical signals uh, from the eye talk to the molecular clockwork. And so, um, we're going to, I'm just going to touch a little bit on that today. So the next point then is how does light act on the clock to appropriately phase behaviors such as sleep? And this is, the, this is very, the most interesting thing about the clock as far as I'm concerned. It's of course what I've worked on most, but it's, 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 it's kind of taken the attention of the field for many, many years and we still don't completely know what's going on, but we know a lot. And this is the point that the clock controls gating of signaling pathways. What does that mean, gating? Gating is often used when you're talking about signal processing, basically. When the gate is closed, the signal can't get through. So for some reason, even though that light signal is coming in and it's liberating glutamate, the clock is blind to the signal when the gate is closed. When the gate is open, the signal can activate intracellular processes and then initiate the series of steps it takes to move the clock backward or forward because there are two kinds of responses to this single stimulus. And that's another interesting and surprising thing about this system is you get two responses to the same chemical signal. And this all happens at night, which is why I like to put this picture up here so you can remember when it takes place, but it's actually kind of intuitive once I explain it to you. So, um, clock, the, the clock is a dynamic system. I emphasized that in my earlier lectures. And what you see is these circadian time of day changes in response to stimulus sensitivity and then to the response to that stimulus. So now I'm going to lead you through the fundamentals of how light signals to the clock. And this is going back to my first lecture where we have a schematic of, you know, this is not a hamster because why? Who knows? I can already tell it's not a hamster or a human because these are the onsets of activity here. They're coming earlier each day. And hamster would be like this, and so would human and rat. So this is a, um, a mouse probably because that's the other animal of choice. And what it's happened here where the asterisk is, is it's given a flash of light at night. And when you say flash, most of these studies use about five to 10 minutes of light. And notice what happens to the onset of wheel running. What's happened? Is there anything expected or unexpected there? I know so you guys know this, Sam. <laughs> Unexpected. Give me an unexpected. You would expect a shift if you gave a light pulse at the time during the night. Or, or you gave a light pulse during the day. Yeah, and you knew that. Because they should be running at night. Exactly, so exactly. Light, they didn't respond to the They light. didn't respond to the light. Expected. You expect it, but not if you don't know anything about the clock. And so, so there are kind of several surprising things. And I, this is probably not so fair because it's inverted. Because so this is night because it's got all the activity. And so this is somewhere over, this is the animal's day. If we had this double plotted, this would be where, you know, where it would be in the ending of its running cycle would be. So this just keeps moving as if it had never seen the light. Um, now, in this experiment, the animal was given a flash of light a few hours into its active period because it's a nocturnal room. So it's basically early in the night. And notice what immediately happens. Unlike this continuous onset here, you get an immediate step back 
That's called a delay in the phase. We speak of phasing as just looking at the time of onset. And if it's the same time each day and you do a periodogram analysis to look for the major periodicities, this period would be, what, 23.5 hours. In this case, where you get this step back, the phasing of the clock is no longer, the onset is no longer here. It's moved back, it's delayed, and then the animal resumes its activity from that point. It's what we do when we change time zones, basically. And then in the third example, the animal gets a flash of light at the end of the night, and now look at what's happening. Here's the original pattern, and you see this jump forward. So at the end, later part of the night, the light signal moves the clock in the opposite direction from what it did in the early part of the night. And we can then take these kind of data, and what we're doing is that we're looking at the degree of change in phasing. This is none. This is a delay of about three hours, and this is an advance of about three hours. And then we can construct a graphic relationship, a quantitative relationship of the, uh, the relationship between the time of day of the stimulus, the light, and the response. And this is what we see. It's a classic light phase response curve. Every animal on Earth responds in this way. And that's what's so kind of interesting and surprising about it. They may have different amplitudes of the change, but all of them are insensitive to light feeding into the circadian system when it happens during the day. And this animal is in continuous darkness, so basically this is so-called subjective day. It's the day of the clock. It's the day of, of, the, of the environment the animal came out of. And then in early night, the light starts to stimul stimulate a phase delay, which peaks about two to three hours into the night. And then this response declines. And then there's an advance late in the night. So this biphasic phase response curve is the classic response to light. And basically, this is where the phase response today is. It's no change in the phase. This is the delay to the light in the early night, and that's the advance. Now, most of the work, when you work on a circadian system, if you're going to understand how the clock works in the body, you have to work at multiple levels. And this is just to remind me to emphasize that. And so here we have, in this case, uh, a rat, a hooded rat. Uh, although we, we use many, many mice now, nowadays because of their different kinds of genetics. Much of the work that I'm going to tell you about with respect to the light response was done on these slices of brain that we talked about early on. And here they are, sitting in a little brain slice chamber. These are two brain slices with uh, the third ventricle is the little black mark in the middle. We have an indicator in the media, which is simply minimal salts and glucose and it flows in across, up from the bottom over the brain slices and out. And this is a water jacket in which we bubble high oxygen CO2 to give it a very moist, high oxygen environment. And in that is the environment those, that those brain slices like to live in. And we then can measure what they're doing spontaneously in this isolated environment. And we can also look at what individual cells are doing. So these are all the levels, levels of analysis that were applied to studying how the SCN responds to light. So the next thing I'm going to tell you is, which I don't believe I've mentioned, is that the SCN has a spontaneous rhythm of, of action potential production. So action potentials are the electrical changes that are the language of the brain. They're self-propagated along the axon. They're what cause neurotransmitter release at the, at the synapse to follower cells. And this is basically a schematic, but, but pretty close to what it really looks like, of the rhythm of electrical activity. It, in, the, in the subjective day, because this is in a brain slice chamber, um, you basically see a peak in the electrical activity midday, and then it declines, it's low at night, it peaks the next day, and so on. And then if you give it a delay, if any stimulus that you give it, if it delays the phase, and you're testing it with this firing rate assay, it's going to move the time of peak backwards. Conversely, if you're giving it some kind of treatment which advances the clock, it's going to move this rhythm forward. So this is moving in this direction. So this is an extremely simple yet very valuable assay because you can sit and record for a couple days, do the treatment, and 
if your slice lives, which is necessary, and your electrical recording setup is strong, you will get this kind of data every time you do the experiment. And you can, with diligence, you can very pretty quickly learn what the elements are that excite the change and also what the signaling downstream elements from the receptor are, which is what we need to understand if we're going to see how it accesses the clock in the nucleus. So these are wheel running data for light. So here's the kind of data I showed you. Um, this is in the hamster at this point in the early night. Circadian time is what we call, we talked about this from the chronobiology chapter, it's how we reckon time in a aperiodic environment. It's clock time. It's basically the time the clock is keeping. And, and so once we're in the brain slice, we talk about it as, as circadian time based on um, the environment the animal came from. So this is two hours after darkness in the colony that the animal came from. And notice here the flash of light is offsetting the wheel running activity. This is real data, not the schematic. And then in the late night around circadian time 20, four hours before light would have gone on in the animal colony, it moves the other direction, so it's advanced. So this is, this is to be expected, and this certainly had been published before the, uh, the following study had done. But what was important about this study, which was published in Science, was that when we did the experiment with glutamate, this excitatory neurotransmitter, this is the real data for the mean running activity of the electrical rhythm. Then if you apply glutamate over here, around circadian time 14, you get a delay in the spontaneous action potential rhythm. And if you apply it late, about this point, you get an advance. So very, very similar, certainly in sign, the directionality to what we saw for the effect of light on wheel running. And remember, this is very far away from what was done in the brain slice chamber. This is your animal in a cage that saw a flash of light, jumped on the wheel at a different time, and so you're looking at it's the timing, the patterning of its activity. In this case, we have the naked little SCN brain slice. We put a drop of glutamate right on the SCN for, for five or 10 minutes, wash it off, and look to see the next day and the next what if anything, the change in the spontaneous action potential activity was. And what's remarkable is they're essentially the same. And these are the phase response curve for the drop of glutamate and for the light phase response. And this is, was really shocking that they could be that similar and was part of the proof that glutamate is the messenger of light. And uh, we know a lot about the neurotransmitter that it works through and some of the messengers that it activates. And subsequently, people went back into the animal and used blockers of glutamate to see if they could block the light response, and they did. So the, the evidence is now incontrovertible that glutamate is the messenger of the primary messenger of light coming in. Now, you will only hear this from me, probably, but this is the way I think it's important to think about the clock. We talked about the fact that it's dynamic and it's changing over the course of the day and night. So if you take the phase response to light or glutamate in the early night, which was that delay in wheel running or spontaneous action potentials, there's two things a delay could be. One is the clock stops for a while. It's like putting a stick in the spoke of the cogs so they can't keep moving. And then something causes it to decay, and three hours later, everything picks up exactly from where it was. And the other way to think about it is that because the clock is dynamic, you're actually changing the state of the clock. And you're going back to a place that you were three hours earlier. And the same could hold true for the advance, that advancing the clock would actually move it ahead. And in fact, we, uh, we published a paper in Neuron in 2004 showing that the phase advance part is definitely dynamic that you can show that once the clock moves here, it responds to signals differently than it responded here. And you can, you can look at uh, the signaling pathways, the ability to respond to glutamate, which doesn't exist here. And you can look at induction of clock genes. And all of them behave reporting that the clock is in a different state after this very brief stimulus. Luke. What are the implications on that on basically just staying up really late and having you know, bright lights <laughs> 
know? Well, now that is a good question. I mean, it's certainly the case that bright lights at night will reset your clock. And then when you are out in the morning, which I just did this Sunday night, as a matter of fact, you go out in the next morning and light is there and you're active and you start eating in the daytime, that's going to work against your phase, the, let's say the phase advanced if that was the last stimulus you saw. But there is a tension and certainly your system is, is in disequilibrium. It's the kind of thing actually in the summer paper where he talks about giving these animals these very short lighting cycle, schedules. The system is in dis disequilibrium. It will have effects probably on your physiology, your ability to learn things, and your mood. But that doesn't keep us from living that way. If we have a fixed deadline, it probably does mean, however, that we are not operating at our peak. I mean, I, I know it means that. But you actually come up in your performance um, if you have complete sleep deprivation the next morning. And uh, I was on a panel some years ago where the Air Force Office of Scientific Research had an officer who's responsible for looking at sleep in uh, various uh, military units. Their military is very interested in knowing who, who's ready to go to combat next. Who's basically who's well rested and who's exhausted. And um, to do this, they took an elite group of um, soldiers and they sleep deprived them as long as they could. I mean, they just kept, you know, days. And they gave them a whole battery of tests, you know, physical tests, climbing, um, marksmanship, um, computations. And what's really interesting is if you look at their, their um, performance, it goes like this. So basically, this is their performance on the first day. And then, of course, as you get into the night, the first night, it's down. And then the second, then as you get toward morning, it goes up. But it doesn't go up as high as it did the first morning. And so, but, but it's higher than it was at the low point of the night. And then it goes down. And then the next night, it's a little lower. And so on. And so what this is telling us is that even for young men in the very best physical condition, very well trained, you cannot perform up to your peak if you become sleep deprived. And so that's then, of course, led to people trying to figure out how you can avoid the, 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 the side effects of sleep deprivation. So you don't have to sleep. No one's been able to figure that out yet. But there are, I think modafinil is one of the drugs that people have tried to use to see if it can you know, minimize your loss of cognitive abilities with sleep deprivation. But it's certainly an area that, for lots of reasons, for shift workers, for truck drivers, um, what is it called, this Interstate Commerce Commission, they're all very, very interested in this area because of the ability, they, you know, they want to make it better for people to be able to work at night. So, I mean, our whole modern life is involved in, in migrating into the night, you know, and we all do it. But the question is, how can you make it so it's not as doesn't have these kind of detrimental effects? So now I'm going to move on to talk about how the light signal interfaces with the molecular clockwork. And sorry for you guys who missed the first couple lectures, but um, we talked about the the phase response curve. I mean, not the phase response curve. Excuse me, the negative feedback loop of the clockworks, where you have the positive elements, which are what? Tell me some, somebody tell me what the positive elements are. Somebody besides Sam. <laughs> Remember the positive elements? b mall and clock, that's right, b mall and clock. The last thing I talked about with respect to elements. And they're coming down and they're turning on transcription of the negative elements, which are basically in Drosophila, clock and timeless. And the question is, when light comes in, how does it affect this dance of the transcription factors? And um, so this was a very, very hot area, especially in Drosophila biology, because there you could study it very well with the various tools of molecular biology. And so this is what, you remember the, the dance of the, real dance of the transcription factors from that lecture. 
So in Drosophila, and it's similar in us, but it's not as well understood because there's so many more players. And that is the main photopigment, um, I mean, it's a photoreceptor, I shouldn't have stopped that. It is a photoreceptor, but in the SCN, it doesn't see light. So it's called cryptochrome because it is photosensitive and it was a very ancient pigment that was involved in DNA repair. In the clock, it's downstream from the glutamate signal that's coming in from light. And so here's cryptochrome, also known as cry, sitting out in the, in the cytoplasm and light comes in and it comes, then it comes into the nucleus and it degrades timeless. And once timeless is gone, period can't be sitting on the DNA anymore. And what happens to the unprotected period in the presence of double time? It gets, well, it comes off the clock and it's degraded. But then you have clock and beam all available to go in and restart transcription. So the negative inhibition is released. This is the story that's been best studied in the Drosophila clock. And that's just, you know, they're making their, they're making their proteins again. So then the loop continues. So um, that wasn't a very satisfactory answer, I know. But that's sort of the beginning of, of knowing what happens. What I can tell you is that in the SCN, there's immediately an induction. Light immediately induces the period one gene, which is one of the three forms of period. And it behaves like an early response um, modulator, basically. It goes up, and then the rest of the genes get turned on that move the clock ahead. In the early night, you also get induction of period two, the other, a second form of period, which we think is part of the real timekeeping me mechanism. And those two events are hallmarks of the response in mammals to light, uh, the molecular response. If you block the rise in period one with, you can use little short sequences of, um, they're called oligonucleotides, they basically bind to the RNA and prevent it from being transcribed. They prevent the, the phase shift. Um, and you can, you can do all kinds of manipulations, but absolutely you need peri period one induced and period two in the early night. Um, so now I'm going to move ahead and I'm going to talk a little bit about different responses to different zeitgebers or time givers. So um, we spend a lot of time on light. Up until the last few years, people really only thought about light as a time giver. But as I said when I was talking to Luke, there are lots of other signals that can adjust timing. And I'm just going to give you a sense of what they are. Um, some of the systems that respond. So, of course, we have glutamate and the light response. But we also have um, another neurotransmitter system where acetylcholine, the very same neurochemical that causes your muscles to contract. The acetylcholine has a role in the brain, and it's only made in two places. One of them is in the brain stem, right down here. Um, I'm not going to bother you with the names of those. The, it's basically the pedicular tegmentum and the lateral dorsal tegmentum, but then also in a part of the basal forebrain involved in alertness, basically attending to something changing in your environment. So it has to do with learning. And both of these cholinergic sites have been implicated in being able to adjust clock timing, I'll put it that way, under different conditions. The brainstem areas are involved in sleep regulation and the forebrain area is involved in learning. And now let's go back to, oh, yes. So this is just a, to remind me to tell you that once you get in to the membrane and glutamate or acetylcholine binds to the membrane, there's a whole cascade of second messengers that are changing that mediate this response. It's a very complex and interesting response. What I find fascinating, and this is an area I've worked for many years, is that the signals are the very same ones that cause long-term changes in the part of, parts of the brain involved in learning. It's as if these, these signals of change state are so strong and robust that you can't tinker with them and change them. 
But we do have the sort of conundrum that in the early night, the signal delays the clock, and in the late night, it advances it. And what we know is that once you activate this glutamate receptor, which causes calcium to go into the cell, nitric oxide synthase is the target of the calcium, this, the whole signal changes. All the downstream parts are different. And that's what's so remarkable. Once you get here, the clock only permits one kind of response because that, that ensures the phase delay, I guess I would say, but that response goes through calcium-induced calcium release, a very, very potent stimulus of change. This is the, the receptor that's on your muscles and causes the calcium release for rapid muscle contraction. It's uh, very rare in brain. Uh, it was first found here. And this then is part of the phase delay. You cannot get that response in the late night. Rhyatidine receptors, which are these calcium receptors here, are basically inactivatable under normal conditions. Uh, but we know that they're there, and that in itself is interesting. In the late night, it goes through a different target, which involves a second messenger called cyclic GMP, which is structurally close to cyclic AMP, which we talked about, but it has different act a different synthetic enzyme and a different kinase that it activates. So there's this bifurcation of the signaling pathways. Now, just so you really appreciate how unusual, that how, how much you can play around with the clock because of its dynamic nature. This is what I just told you about. The early night, you're going through glutamate, nitric oxide, rhyanidine receptor, and this calcium-induced calcium release takes you back in time. In the late night, the other target, cyclic G, takes you forward in time. But if you put acetylcholine on, you only get advances, and part of the signal is similar to what it was in the late night. Why is that? Why is that? Why can this signal, so you have, here, what's, here you have glutamate giving you either a delay or an advance, but a different messenger, acetylcholine, gives you only an advance. And that's, of course, one of the things that we find so interesting about studying the clock. And we know a lot about it right now. And um, you know, these re answers to these questions will be forthcoming. I'll put it that way. But then this is kind of revisiting this dynamic clock. So you have the advance and the delay to glutamate. And then here's acetylcholine coming in and moving it over here, not quite to the same place, because you can measure the size of the shift. It's, it's moving at about six hours from CT18, that's to 24. If glutamate is moving you from CT20 to, uh, well, maybe four hours, maybe this is a little over ambitious where I put the arrow, but it's moving it close to, but maybe not exactly the same place. So what about some other time-giving signals? There's serotonin. Does anybody know, had ever heard of serotonin before? Serotonin is a very, very, you know, interesting neurotransmitter system. How about if I told you that um, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors are the major form of antidepressants that have been used? So serotonin reuptake inhibitors basically make serotonin around a little bit longer, and that suggests that serotonin is involved in affective changes, changes in mood, changes in, you know, the ability to enjoy things, and all the changes that lead to long-term depression, basically. And we know, so it's got an arousal effect. We know that serotonin interfaces with the clock, and all the serotonin is made in another part of the brain. But it comes in, it, it, there's a projection to the SCN, and it can interface with it. And we know that peptides are involved, and some of those peptides are involved with the responses to drugs of abuse. The SCN is a target of change to amphetamines. There's a time of day um, uh, drug seeking for uh, drugs like cocaine. Um, and this is what Josh Gulley, who works on drugs of abuse over in psychology, is going to talk, come and talk to us about. He, he's the drugs of abuse guy in, you know, how does it work? the psychology of drug abuse, and he hadn't really worked on clocks and drug abuse, but he's good. He, he looked at that literature and he said, oh, I'm so glad you asked me to do this because there's a huge literature on the time of day effects and the role of the clock in sort of giving a time stamp to the whole uh, addiction experience. And then we have peptides involved in feeding behavior and restricted feeding, so you only make food available 
at a very restricted time of day will completely override the response to light. And why do you think that would be? Which is more important in your life? That you know that it's daytime or that you know where there's food? Exactly. And so, and so an animal who has only got food there for a couple hours a day will completely change its behavior and anticipate the arrival of the food. You're giving the food at a very fixed time. And that's part of what the clock does. Remember the, the movie of the, um, the sunflower that started off with dawn and moved over the course of the day, and then during the night it moved to anticipate dawn. And that is thought to be the, uh, the advantage that clocks give you, is you're ready for the changes in your environment. You're not completely responding to them. And we're going to talk a little bit about metabolism and clocks as, as we go ahead. But notice all the different kinds of neurotransmitters. When I put peptides here, I already told you there are many, many, many neuropeptides that come in or are in the SCN. So there are multiple systems that can feed into this. In fact, I was trying to remember to tell you this, and now's my chance. Um, there's a, Shabona Mir is a, uh, he's in psychology department at uh, Concordia University in Montreal. And he's a very creative man. He did an experiment very much like what Pavlov did. Now, have any of you ever heard of Pavlov? Pavlov is classic for pairing the bell with the food in his dog's dog colony, so that after several linkage, several co-presentations, the sound of the bell would cause the dog to start to salivate. And you know, we all do that. We all learn how to attend to significant cues that may not be the cue, the smell of the food, but one that may be important because that bell predicted food. And he did that kind of experiment in the clock. He paired the sound of the bell with light. I don't think I told you guys this story. He paired the sound of the bell with light, and after some period of time, the bell would cause the light response. None of us know how that works. But we do know that somehow the auditory system has the ability to feed back on the clock and make that connection so it becomes established. So there's a lot we don't understand. Um, but we do understand a fair amount about what these signals are doing as far as being time givers. So another point that I want to make is the clock has got this sort of plasticity, this ability to change with experience that makes it attentive to what's important about the world, what's important about life, because that's what's going to keep you, you know, surviving, keep you surviving until you reproduce. That's basically what we're designed to do. <laughs> or have fun, what, whichever one. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, the clock is there, and you know it's able to cue into those things. So I, Jen and I published this paper, oh, 10 years ago, and that is all the different systems that had been worked on that the clock can respond to. So I showed you this before. This is the light, glutamate response, and I didn't even put the acetylcholine response in here, but it's going into this part. And then in the daytime, I have a couple peptides in here, but also serotonin works in the daytime. Um, neuropeptide Y, it's an interesting neuropeptide coming back from the visual part of the brain. And then at dawn and at dusk, this system is selectively sensitive to melatonin. That signal of night. Now, that is a very interesting response because the SCN tells the pineal when to make melatonin. So it's on the regulatory pathway, but it's also sensitive to melatonin, but only if the melatonin is produced so it, it impinges on the clock at dawn or dusk. The gate closes then. So you're gating out the response to melatonin all night long, or you might be adjusting your clock continuously because melatonin is there at night. But then when dawn comes, you have another period of sensitivity. And the way in which we interpreted this, Angie MacArthur and I, many years ago when we did this, was that um, this is a seasonal response when night length is changing its relationship to the structure of the clock. Because the clock is, you know, it keeps doing this. That sensitivity to melatonin is there in the brain slice. But it won't see melatonin there until the nights get long and the melatonin profile spreads out. Um, we don't know the answer to that for sure, but 
what that's that's the the status of the hypothesis, and it's certainly true that these have been also then tested in the behaving animal to see if injecting melatonin at the the dawn or the dusk versus the day or the night causes changing in wheel running, and it only works at the at the extremes of the day. So now we're going to come and talk about can alterations in clock elements cause sleep disorders. So we worked our way in to all the signals coming into the clock and we, we know that they impinge upon the, the clock elements. And this then is asking, is there any consequence of having a change in your clock elements, your clock genes, due to mutation? We now know that life experiences can change you know, epigenetically change the way in which your genes are expressed, but what's the evidence for that? And so this is one of my favorite stories, because um, I watched it unfold and I heard Louis Patechik tell the story, can sleep disorders arise within the circadian system? Um, Louis Patechik is a, an MD, PhD, who when he did this original work was at the University of Utah, where he worked very closely with Chris Jones, who was a human geneticist. And what they decided to do was to try to look for genetic basis, bases of neural disorders. <coughs> so they're so basic, those are hard to find, basically, because um, they're com usually they're very complex genetic systems. But what, one of the things they decided to ask about was sleep disorders. And so they, they and one of the reasons it was very productive to study human genetics in Utah is because the large Mormon population there has extremely good records of genealogy and large families. And if you're going to study genetics, you've got to have more than one or two offspring, practically, because otherwise, you, you, you know, the genes, the recessive genes are just hidden. So if you have big families and you have all the records there, you can hopefully make some progress on understanding disorders. So we put this call out. Is there anybody there who thinks they have a really persistent sleep disorder? So this isn't somebody who's, you know, had, had some sort of depression and they're not sleeping very well or stress. Someone who really feels like they've suffered from a sleep disorder basically for most of their life. And in fact, he got responders. And the responder that is the basis of the story that I'm going to tell you was a grandmother who came in and she said, Dr. Patechik, I'm here because I have always gone to bed early. And I, my husband goes to bed early. We both go to bed early. And all our lives, you know, we go to bed about 7 o'clock. And, you know, it was okay for us. But now I see my grandchildren growing up, getting ready to go to university. And I want them to have a better social life than I had. And so he looked at the family. He went and talked to them. And this is what he found. That these were the original people that he talked to. And when you have a field, the circles are the with females, in this case they call them females, and the males, and they have the trait, and strike means that they're deceased. And then they had, let's see, the lines go to their children, so they had three children. All of them seem to have the trait. You go down, and you see there are lots of people with this particular trait, and that is that they go to bed early. And they also get up early. And so they're living, they're basically running a little fast. Uh, if you go to bed early every night, um, would be like kind of like the mice. Um, you know, and, and light can try to help you with this, but especially for humans, you know, we don't really live our lives like we're getting out and, and seeing the light. And these people have, you know, lived there, look at how many gener five, six generations here. But you see that this trait is coming through a lot. Now it turns out that when they did the genetics, the woman had the altered gene. Her husband was, is what's called a phenocopy. He had something different but that was like what she had as far as the way it was, it, the trait was expressed. But it was very, very prevalent in all these families and all these generations. And when they did the genetic analysis, they found that the period two gene in these humans, so it's called H per two, had a one base change in coding for serine 662. Now, the serine amino acid is a substrate for phosphorylation, which is one of those post-translational modifications we talked about. 
So if you phosphorylate serine 662, that very highly charged phosphate group is going to change the charge distribution around it, so the molecule's conformation is going to change. And it has the potential to change the active state of that molecule. And the, the base change changed serine 62 to a glycine. Um, and the glycine is not a phosphorylated substrate. And it turns out this glycine is in the binding region of the kinase that phosphorylates period two. That goes back to our Drosophila story, but this is in humans. And so basically, they're losing the phosphorylation site. That's the only change that they could find out in their genome, was this particular change. Now, they then did a very thorough study making a mouse that had this change. So they have a mouse now that's got the same change that the humans had. And basically, they ran these um, samples out on gels and where they're migrating according to their molecular weight. And they're looking at um, they're looking at the molecular weight, and I don't think they have any any label for phosphate. That's what I was thinking about. But basically, here's the wild type. Here's the mutant mouse. In this case, they made made that serine 662 into glycine, and now they've made it into an alanine. So it still can't be phosphorylated. So this is like a fake mutation. So they just want to get rid of that phosphorylation site. And notice. These are all about this running about the same molecular weight. And then after 60 minutes, they're adding, um, they added casein kinase, and they're looking at the phosphorylatability of that molecule. Here's the wild type, and notice it's shifted up, and that's what you expect from adding the phosphate group. And they run, may run a little anomalously. It may not be you know, exactly the size of the phosphate group, but um, this is what happens. In the mutant, it didn't shift as much. So it's way down here, almost where it was before. And I don't know what's happening here, but the ser this, gold, this alanine one is all over the place. Um, now, and then they used alkaline phosphatase. That takes the phosphate group back off. So you've got a kinase that puts the phosphate on. That's the casein kinase. And then you do the phosphate group, and you're just nipping off any phosphates that are there. And you can see that they're basically all running about the same. So this then is really, really strong evidence that what you've done is changed a critical site in the pyr2 molecule that determines um, its phosphorylatability by this key clock element, casein kinase, also called double time. Now, interesting, and I didn't give you all the, the, the details about casein kinase when we talked about Drosophila, but I did give you some. And that was that it interacts with, in Drosophila, it interacts with period. It uh, mediates degradation of the period monomer if timeless isn't there. In the case of the, when its period has dimerized with timeless, you, it facilitates nuclear translocation. And it also can, all, if in, the, in the mutation, it can alter the length of the period, and some of those flies become arrhythmic. Um, Shortly after they figured this out in Drosophila, there was a group at the University of Virginia that had these pet hamsters that they'd been keeping. And what they, the reason they kept them was because they had unusual uh, periods. They found them in a pet store, and they, this is before, well, you can keep hamsters at home. You can still get them in pet stores. But this particular pet hamster, they knew it ran fast. And they brought it into the lab, and they, it's called the tau mutant, tau meaning period. And they also found a change in that same site where an arginine was replaced by a cysteine, again in the pocket of a casein kinase. Interestingly, you can do rhythms, very nice rhythms on this animal, and its period is 21.5 hours. It's way down there. This is a very valuable experimental model because you can then vary the period. You can knock out the SCN, put a short period SCN in it, and ask, what rhythm does the animal follow? And I'm going to ask you, what rhythm do you think it follows when you put that short SCN in there? Got rid of the wild type SCN. Remember, we talked about transplants. Short, exactly. It's short. It's, the SCN is driving the periodicity of not only the animal behavior, but basically all the other clocks in that animal through whatever messages it's giving out. So 
you know, who would have expected that? So it turns out this is a great, you know, very, like I said, you just have to think of the right experiment to do with the animal. And then we have this human, and I, the, I mean, these people <laughs> in, in Utah, and I didn't tell you, but what that, this syndrome is, it was very well known before they were studied, familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. Familial, because it's inherited. Advanced sleep phase, because they get up early, they go to bed early, syndrome. And you know, many people have it. They may not have as, it is as extremely as this family had it, but there are many people, do any of you know people who always get up at five in the morning, no matter what? We all do, we all do. And you know, they just can't sleep late. My prediction, although they haven't been tested of course, is that they have some tweaking, you know, some difference in their clock mechanism that causes them to run toward morning. Um, and then, well, I think I'm gonna go into the disorders now. This is, t this is a transition slide. Um, <laughs> and that is, can sleep disorders arise within the circadian timing system? Well, I already told you that they can, and there are lots of them. Um, this is just to remind me to point out to you that these are all certain kinds of sleep disorders. Mike. Are there people who have the opposite, who yes. always get up late and go to bed late? Yes, yes, there are. And those are called sleep phase, delayed sleep phase syndrome. And apparently, I'm one of those people. <laughs> and I, I didn't know this until I was rooming at a Gordon a scientific conference next to one of the human biologists, psychiatrists actually at Oregon. And he, uh, like the second day of the conference, he was a friend of mine. He said, Martha, you have delayed sleep phase syndrome. And I looked at him and I went, well, I'm happy. <laughs> it seems to serve me well. <laughs> but because uh, he, he could hear, I just stay up late at night. But you know, that's. There's a, a huge range of human behaviors and phenotypes. Yes? If you have one or the other, can you retrain yourself like, in the other cycle? You can. It's just like what you do with the hamster if you put it or the, or the mouse. I mean, it gets to be harder. But, um, you know, a person who has deep sleep, delayed sleep phase syndrome is not going to want to have a job where they have to get there by 6 in the morning. That's a, that's a hard change to do every day, especially advancing. It's harder than delaying. And remember from the paper that we read, was it only last week? That's bad for your health. That will shorten your life, according to those experiments with animals. Um, but you can moderate it. You know, you can, you can work with it. And you, you, know, you can try to go to bed early. You can put the lights on in the morning. You know, try to be active in the morning. That'll help move you ahead. So there are lots of ways by, by behavioral, basically, behavioral and light therapy, you can move in that direction. So, so these are some of the sleep disorders that people go to the doctor complaining about. Well, not drowsy driving, that's just, you know, we all do that and that's, that's just a problem if you stay up late and, and drive. But not, um, this is basically insomnia, people who can't sleep at night. Very, very prevalent. This is the major reason people go and ask for sleeping pills and I will tell you none of them work because they all basically work on a receptor that tones down your whole nervous system. And so there, there's nothing that's specific for sleep. So there's a very big interest in developing a very specific sleeping pill. This is daytime drowsiness, which may be that you didn't get enough sleep last night, or it may be that um, you, know, you have a, dis, dis, de, a loss of coherency in the time at which you sleep. And then we have people like nurses who work deep nights for long periods of time or continually shift. <coughs> and then we have travelers who were experiencing jet lag. So these are the disorders of the circadian function. So with respect to the sleep-wake cycle, we have jet lag, shift work, and then we have this delayed sleep phase, and we have the advanced sleep phase. And this example I gave you was human period two, but Patechek is now at University of California at San Francisco, and he with his, his wife, whose name is Ing Hui Fu, um, are look, they're continue, continuing to study changes in the clock system that are responsible for neurological dis disorders. Sleep is an easy way to screen for them, but it's not the only way. And then we have non-24 hour sleep-wake syndrome and irregular sleep-wake syndrome. And then if we go to other kinds of disorders, we have affective disorders, those are mood disorders. 
disorders of how happy we are or how in, engaged we are with the natural world. And these include seasonal affective disorder, SAD, which I told you about, or, which is low light, short days, tips many people over toward being depressed. And then we have a unipolar depression. Uh, bipolar depression is also affected by the clock phasing. And then we have aging. Aging changes the coherence of your clock. And it can lead to changes in your sleep-wake cycles that are quite severe. And then all the body systems that follow the central clock. So if you're not having a strong signal or the right time of day signal from your clock because you're not getting enough light or because your, your SCN is losing coherence, you then have problems with your other body systems. And then we have congenital blindness, which is where you don't have light coming in. And the, 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 the friend of mine who told me I had the delayed sleep phase syndrome is, is one of the key people working with how to entrain blind people. Because blind, truly blind people are like the people in the bunker. They're constantly free running. Very, very difficult to hold a job. Can't, they don't get any light. And um, so they tend to be basically continuously free running. So after two weeks, they're working you know, we're in, in the night where it used to be the day. And he is very effectively using melatonin as a signal, as a cue in place of light to pull them into a 24-hour cycle. And then we have people with various kinds of tumors in the hypothalamic region. And these may involve um, optic nerve glaucoma. I don't know exactly why that says glaucoma because that's usually in the eye. Uh, pituitary adenomas and craniopharyngiomas, which basically the problem with these is they put pressure on the optic nerve. And that compromises its ability to send the signals to the SCN. It's also the case that a put I actually have an acquaintance a friend who had a, a pituitary adenoma, and that gives you um, acromegaly, where you know you're. It's like a, a pituitary giantism, where you get sort of very heavy brow, and your hands continue to get big, feet continue to get big, and this. This friend of mine, um, who was on the faculty here, very eminent scientist, um, had terrible sleep disorders. I remember him telling me about that. And uh, he had surgery, and it was a benign tumor, and they took it out. And not only did his sleep disorders go away, but you know his appearance changed. So once that tumor stopped causing an overproduction of growth hormone, the hands got smaller, the feet, you know, he kind of reverted back, not completely, but he certainly, he, he was visibly changed. Um, and this is one of those, I don't know if any of you ever read the New York Times Magazine section, they have these medical mysteries and people go in and nobody can figure out what's wrong with them. And that was actually his story, basically, the story of, of you know, how they figured out what his sleep disorder was and then it had these other complications. And, um, oops, I went the wrong way. So this actually, I'm just going to summarize now, because this is like sort of the end of the fundamentals of how, how do we keep time. And that is clocks are fundamental to life. They're cellular, so they're cell-based, and they're in every cell. They're functionally dynamic like the cell cycle clock. And they provide temporal orchestration of tissue-specific cell processes in the lung, in the in the liver, in the pancreas, in the bone, in the stem cells that migrate out of your bones. And the clock to clock coupling is necessary to keep them working together. And um, the, clock, this, the gating to the molecular clock works is at a cellular level because it's at the level of the receptors and the signaling pathways that then let that signal access the molecular clock work. And then if we go, oops, Yes, and the clock is capable of flexible and plastic changes. But then if we go to the organismic level, we have that everything's pattern, behavior, physiology, metabolism, hormone production at 24 hours, that it's uh, organized by the SCN, even though it's cell-based throughout the body. The system has the clock inputs and outputs. And then why is light necessary? Because it synchronizes the clock, the circadian system to the solar cycle, 
and that disorders of sleep regulation can be from the environment, as we talked about with, for instance, jet lag or shift work, genetic, physiological, developmental in the case of aging, or pathological in the case of the tumors, and that synchrony between day and night and the body is important for good health and longevity. And that brings me to the end of, I hardly ever come to the end of one subject at the, the end of a lecture, but I did it today, and that's great. And um, we're going to take a little break, and then we'll, we'll discuss those papers. And then on next Wednesday, I'm going to talk about sleep. <laughs>